Good morning. This is the Vermont House Transportation Committee, and we have a hearing today just for one hour from now until uh, noon, and then at one o'clock we meet again until two o'clock. Um, our agenda can be found on our website. Um, let's quickly introduce ourselves, and um, I'll try to do it in the proper order. Uh, I'm Kurt McCormack. I represent Burlington, and I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, Barbara Murphy. Uh, Barbara Murphy, I represent Fairfax, vice chair of the committee. Tim? Uh, Tim Cork and I represent Bennington District 2-1. Okay, now it's just gonna be the order that you <laughs> in the pictures. Uh, Representative Savage. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Savage. I represent Swanton and Sheldon. Representative McCoy. Good morning, I'm Patty McCoy, Representative Patty McCoy, representing the towns of Pulteney and Ira. Representative White. Good morning, I'm Representative White, and I serve the town of Hartford. Representative Quimby. Connie Quimby, I live in Concord. I represent eight towns in Essex, Caledonia. Representative Potter. Dave Potter from uh, Clarendon. I represent Clarendon, West Rutland, Proctor, Wallingford, and a little bit of Tinmouth. Representative McCarthy. I'm Mike McCarthy, and I represent uh, St. Albans City and the southern portion of St. Albans Town. Representative, Co uh, no, we did Corcoran. Um, Representative Burke. Um, Representative Molly Burke. I represent a part of Brattleboro. Oh. Representative Sullivan. Hi, um, uh, Representative Mary Sullivan, South End Hill section of Burlington. And uh, Lori, would you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lori Morse, the uh, committee assistant. And uh, Anthea, are you still on? I am Anthea Dexter Cooper, Office of Legislative Council. And Neil? Neil Schickner, Joint Fiscal Office. And thank you. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Michelle Blumauer, who will introduce her um, Bez, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chair McCormick. I'm Michelle Blumauer. I'm the Director of Policy Planning and Intermodal Development for the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Um, the two focal topics um, for me this morning are the um, updates related to the CARES Act COVID relief funding specific to our um, Amtrak uh, service as well as our state airports. So <clears throat> I'll start first with the state airports. Um, so the state of Vermont will benefit in two ways from the FAA CARES Act funding. First, uh, the FAA has advised us that our capital projects, our construction projects for fiscal year 20 will be approved at 100% federal funding for any eligible items in the project, as opposed to 90% federal funding, which is the usual share. And this will include those projects funded through our airport improvement program, as well as any supplemental uh, funding we receive for grants. Um, at this point, um, we are still working with the FAA to confirm exactly which projects this will impact uh, because some of the awards have not been made yet, but as soon as we have those details, we'll advise you. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, there are some projects where portions of the project um, were, um, that were not eligible for federal funding um, will not be able to receive this CARES Act bump up. Um, an example of that for uh, representatives Murphy and Savage in terms of their interest in the Franklin County Airport and Mac Representative McCarthy is the 401 foot um, extension of the, um, of the runway. So I just wanted to highlight that because I know it's an item folks have been watching. The second um, way that um, our airports will benefit from this um, CARES Act funding is uh, will be awarded almost $300,000, $299,000. Um, as the airport sponsor, we can use the funds to support keeping the airports open and operational, operational during this pandemic. And we may also choose to use the funds for capital projects 
um, by following the standard process used for all capital projects in terms of eligible projects. Um, so I think uh, everybody is aware that the state airports have been operational this entire period and, um, and so that will help in that regard. Um, we did ask the FAA if the funding was eligible for use um, to waive the rent uh, for fixed based operators. Uh, these are the folks that we have um, engagements with to do certain functions at airports, as well as other businesses on airports um, or to reimburse for other expenses these fixed based operators might be incurring during these times in terms of cleaning supplies, PPE, et cetera, uh, personal protective equipment. Um, the FAA has advised us that while the FBOs undertake certain duties such as ground maintenance and fueling as part of their land lease agreements with the agency, they are not providing a contracted service and therefore under the FAA guidance are not eligible to receive this funding. Um, so that was a, a bit of a disappointment. Um, we were hoping to be able to support these folks in a little more robust manner, um, but um, that was the determination. So in addition to the um, funding um, and the match share coming to the agency, I'd also like to note that the Burlington International Airport will benefit from the match share reduction um, on their uh, pr projects, as well as receiving $8.7 million in COVID, COVID support for their operations. And um, so that's um, a significant um, piece to note in terms of the Burlington Airport. Um, a few other items to update you on related to aviation. Um, the guidance within the governor's executive order addendum 10 um, that was issued last week, um, you will see um, many of our team members, the staff at the airports beginning our spring work and maintenance operations. Um, and for some of you that where we're doing construction, you'll see some of that construction work beginning in these two person uh, teams uh, for project area activities. Um, there may be some testing uh, happening uh, survey um, as well as our general uh, safety activities, uh, mowing or in today's case, maybe a little plowing of snow. Um, and also, um, the some of the state airports, five of them have been identified, and you've probably seen this on the news as um, local um, commodity point of distribution locations for the distribution of food in, in the um, means of uh, meals ready to eat. And um, the state airports uh, use as these um, commodities point of distribution locations was set up over a year ago, and um, we've exercised these deployments in coordination with other uh, federal, state, and local partners, including FEMA and the State Emergency Operations Center. And so we were well poised when we were called upon to be um, the distribution center points for these. Um, the first is starting today at the Franklin County Airport in Highgate. Um, uh, Rutland Regional Airport will be on the 24th of April. Uh, Hartness Airport in Springfield will be on the 27th. Uh, the Morse Airport in Bennington will be on the 28th. And then a Northeast Kingdom International Airport in Coventry will be on the 29th. Um, we've also been referring our fixed based operators and our airport businesses to the Agency of Commerce and the Small Business, Business Administration, as well as their regional development corporations um, for the business support that they would be eligible for uh, through that, um, uh, those particular entities. So that is the um, aviation cares um, update and general aviation update. And I'm happy to pause here and take any questions. Question for Michelle? I have one. Um, just uh, what did you say Burlington Airport was going to get? And, and it's not th through the same program as the state airports, right? Um, so it is through the CARES Act, which is the same program we're going to be funded through. And there's two ways um, airports receive support. One is um, to have their um, local match share eliminated in this case. Um, 
And uh, so Burlington Airport, I'm sure has projects underway that will qualify for that. I just don't have those details. And the second was the um, 8.7 million in uh, CARES Act funding that they will get for their operations support. So do we know how much money uh, we get for the projects, not for the operations? Um, we're still analyzing that. Um, some of the grant awards um, have not yet been made for FY20. And so we're, uh, we're still um, assembling that information to see what the savings will be for us. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's whatever it is, it, it'll be helpful given the T-fund shortage. So. Yeah, it sure will be helpful. Um, when you say for the for the um, state airports, when you say uh, projects, do you mean projects that have they have to be have have been programmed? Yes, these are um, pro construction projects we've received FAA grant awards for, or will be receiving this spring. A lot of times, uh, well, in most cases, what happens is um, we will receive um, awards. Um, after we've done all the permitting, all of the project design, et cetera. And so, um, so those awards still may be pending. Uh, and I think there's some supplemental um, awards that may be pending. So I would say within the next couple of weeks, we'll have more detail on which of the projects benefit this from this CARES Act money. Okay. But will it work like the transit CARES Act money, which is on top of um, other federal grants? So um, the grant award um, match share going from 90-10 federal state to 100% federal will basically just reduce our already planned obligations <laughs> in those areas. Um, the 300,000 that we're getting for operations support will be on top of um, what we would have otherwise had to use from our transportation fund because all of our maintenance activities are funded by state dollars at the airports. And so basically this just helps offset the lost revenues that essentially we won't have to cover those maintenance operations because we've had a downturn in the T fund. And so this $300,000 we received could be used to backfill that um, that hole. Yeah, like the transit. Yep. Uh, other questions for, on the airports? No questions from up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Your hands up. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to do that in hands. Has your hand been up for a while, Patty? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I've got Patty and then Mike. Okay. So I just want to qualify that, uh, Michelle, that you are saying that Burlington gets 8.7 million, but additionally, they will fall under your number one for capital improvement projects at 100%. Yep. Um, do they fall into the second category of the 299,000 as well? That's for them, that's the 8.7 million. Okay, so they So are, we're getting 300,000, they're getting 8.7 okay. million. All right, good. Thank you very much. I apologize for that big difference. Um, Representative McCarthy. Uh, Michelle, I know you said that you still had some um, projects you weren't, uh, that were in question. I really liked the memo that you had done uh, around explaining how the public transit money went out. And I was wondering yeah. if you might be willing to prepare something like that, explaining how the FAA money gets doled out. Yes. Um, and if you do have a, a sense of, you know, if we assume that most of the projects sort of a order of magnitude of how big the, the, the hole uh, that that 10% not coming from state dollars will fill. Yep, I can do that. Okay, that'd be good. Thanks. Anything else on airports? Okay, thank you. Uh, next. Okay. So for the, um, I think you all recognize that we um, invest about $8 million annually to pay uh, for Amtrak service that comes to Vermont. That's state fund, uh, state transportation fund investment for the Ethan Allen and the Vermonter. And um, Amtrak received a direct CARES Act subsidy 
uh, under the, the CARES Act um, investments. Um, and they were required for uh, to provide some relief to states who pay uh, for state supported service in addition to the money they receive for their own uh, relief. Um, this is a little bit more complicated uh, 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 investment strategy in terms of how we receive our, our uh, relief, but um, we found out on Tuesday that the CARES Act will cap our state pay payments for, uh, for FY20 at 80% of the state costs that were paid in 21, excuse me, 19. <laughs> it's confusing to even talk about. Um, the, um, just to sort of remind folks, we went uh, to a system whereby we pay Amtrak for actual costs of running the train service. Um, and they figure out those actual costs. Um, and then we, um, uh, we, for where we have shared service with other states, each state is uh, split out uh, for their cost share. So um, in addition to um, being um, capping the, our costs at 80% of our 2019 costs, um, the total amount of subsidy available for all states was 239 million. And, um, at this time, there's no specific guidance um, that is printed uh, that I could share with you in a memo, <laughs> but we are working with Amtrak to ensure that their cost allocations are um, consistent with prior practice. What we believe um, to be our benefit in this um, CARES Act program right now, for FY20, um, we believe that the savings will be $1.9 million. And for FY21, we are estimating that the savings will be um, about a million dollars for a total of um, total savings across both fiscal years of just under three million dollars. Um, in terms of how we um, plan to address these um, savings, in terms of how they will apply. Um, the 1.9 million in FY20 will be simply left in the real appropriation at the end of the year as a year end balance of, of funds that we had planned to expend but uh, won't be needing to. And um, similar to how we have um, done this in past years, um, year end balances will be used to, um, to basically they'll be swept in this case uh, from any appropriation where we have a year-end balance to help us with um, balancing the uh, $42 million shortfall we have in the T-Fund this year. So this, again, is another small amount of money to help us with balancing the T-Fund appropriation shortfall. And um, while we have guesstimated the, uh, the FY21 savings to be about a million dollars, um, there there is um, you know, additional information that will come in that will help us sort of nail that down as we go forward. The, um, the change in ridership um, that we're experiencing and uh, some of the other elements in terms of service from Amtrak um, haven't yet all been worked out yet, but um, right now that's what we're estimating for a, a sh <coughs> uh, cost savings. Okay, questions on Amtrak? Uh, uh, yes, Molly. So, um, I, at a, another session, you said that we were saving $450,000 a month by not running the train. Is that correct? I think Neil actually said that. No, Neil said that. Okay. Um, anyway, so I'm just wondering. Will that money also go into money that we're not spending? Would that money also go into filling this hole that we have? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think that um, it would. Um, you know, we because yeah, there are. I, I think we had talked earlier about some of the um, 
some of the base costs being reduced because we're not running the train. Mm -hmm. And while we won't be able to recognize all, you know, absolute savings of all of our costs, because we still have to pay for like equipment that's been purchased and, and some of those other things, um, I expect, and this is part of why it's difficult to estimate um, 20, well, you know, and, and I would say that that has not been factored in Representative Burke. So I think you make a good point that the savings could be a little bit more um, because of the fact that not only are they gave, giving us the CARES Act service reduction discount, so to speak, but then we're also going to have some actual cost savings when they rectify the actuals versus the estimates. Mm -hmm. Michelle, any... Um... Have they mentioned when they think uh, the change will be back? I have not heard any estimate of that at this time. Um, you know, I think that uh, in terms of the Eastern Corridor, that we're all probably on a fairly similar um, tra trajectory in terms of where we are with COVID right now. Um, however, uh, what restarting a uh, public transportation service like the train will involve and what precautions they'll feel need to be in place. And um, just to even the ridership, I mean, that was really the key thing that caused the shutdown was there just weren't enough riders to um, make it feasible to run the trains um, cost effectively. But I anticipate that they are working on a um, return to business solution, and that we'll begin to hear more about that in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, anything else for Michelle on Amtrak? Nope. Okay. As soon as I hear more about the restart program, I'll make sure I get an email out to the committee. So that's all I have this morning specific to those two items. All right, so Michelle, I think we have, um, do you have somebody else ready of the, um, of the agency people we had? Um, we have Wanda next, but if is Wanda, oh, uh, Mike Smith and Wanda, are you ready? Sorry, it takes me a while to find the button. We are we are present and accounted for. Do you have the camera? Well, are you ready to speak? What would you like us to speak on? I looked at the Did agenda. You turn the video yep. on, oh, hold on. I want to turn the video on so you can see us. Uh, you can kind of see us. Hold on, I'll adjust it. There we go. You're at work, huh? We yes, are we are at work three days a week. Well, five days a week, but we are open um, at six of our branch offices. Um, not to the public, but for the staff to come in and uh, and process all of the DMV day-to-day uh, -day business transactions. So, and we're six feet apart. We're a little bit more than that, just so you know. <laughs> and we do have our masks. Yes. Or do you? Okay. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Commissioner, I... I I think we wanted you to tell us about, um, just give us an update on um, the driver's ed um, okay. situation. I know that that board meeting was um, postponed, right? It, uh, no, it's today. It is, it's Actually, it's this, it's this afternoon. So for the record, um, good morning, Commissioner Manoli, Department of Motor Vehicle, and um, Mike Smith, Director of Operations is, um, and with me. Um, the governor's directive, I, I wanna just give a little quick background if I can. The governor's directive to DMV, um, when we cease doing in-person transactions, one of the items that um, that is pointed out is that I need to um, develop among many things, a, um, a proposal to bring exams um, back when we open up. And um, that's because exams were postponed completely. Um, some of our other processes um, that we require typically for a Vermonter um, or a new Vermonter to come into our branch office and do business 
um, we were able to find alternatives to continue supporting um, those services. And an example I'll give you is a VIN verification. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike and his team have had to find alternative ways to do VIN verifications to assist um, the Vermont consumer in purchasing that new car when it's used. And so one of the items um, that we have identified um, is really how do we bring exams back to Vermonters in a slow, methodical way, you know, as we turn the spigot on slowly, as we gradually open up DMV to, um, to the public. Uh, and, we should, and let me interrupt. We just we have a clarification question. Okay. Um, Neil. Neil, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't on that point. Okay, so it wasn't a clarif it was not a clarification question, right? Okay. <laughs> so would you like um, Mr. Snickler, would you like to ask the question? Well, yeah, it was it was about your uh, your mail and online uh, receipts for registration and li licenses. Mike mentioned a week or so ago that uh, they were coming in as expected as as normal. I was wondering if you have continued to see that. Namely, we're um, talking about the impact of the suspension. Of I, the I don't know what um, Director Smith actually commented on, so I guess I will turn this question over to him. But before I do that, um, I want to say to the committee, um, we are monitoring um, our revenues every day. Um, and with our alternative schedule in, um, you know, field taxes coming in, online registrations. We just went live with online renewal of your license. And I want to share with the committee, I am so impressed. Um, this week alone, we had over a thousand people renew their licenses online. They renewed them in the evening, on Saturdays, on Sundays. Yesterday, our deposit for um, online renewal of licenses was $17,000. That's the highest we've, um, we're tracking this. Um, the day before, it was $15,000. Um, just with online renewals, this past week, we had over 1,000 transactions. Online renewals of licenses. Um, so I can only say to the committee, Thank you again for your support of allowing us to modernize um, DMV's IT system. Um, it, that's making a difference. Um, but now back to your question, I'll turn it over to Mike. I had to give my little, my little kudos on that. Um, Mike, go ahead. So uh, what, what Neil's referring to is the level of registration renewals coming through as, as we would normally see. So. I spoke with the lady in the quality control department that sees them come through. Last we spoke, she had said that she's not seen anything that would make her say, oh, wow, there's a huge reduction. So I have not been doing an actual number comparison from year to year. We've been kind of racing in all other directions. I just sent her an email and asked her if that still holds true. She's not responded. But when she does, I'll make sure to, to give that information. OK. Um, Commissioner, is that to say that um, the $23 million loss in revenues that you said, I think you gave that as the worst case um, scenario, uh, we're not likely to, to lose near that much? So I did not give you that $23 million loss in revenue. I believe that came from the Joint Fiscal Office and from, um, yeah. uh, from, from, well, from the Joint Fiscal Office. So I... I cannot speak specifically specifically to um, how they're calculating those. That would have to be that would have to be Neil. Okay. Um, well, Neil, the can um, it, I, I I thought it came from from DMV, but I guess not. So, nope. um, Neil, do you know um, what is estimated for losses now? And, and um, uh, registration. Well, the only, the only thing I've seen is uh, 
the latest um, forecast update for 20. I, I mailed that out there, emailed that to everyone last night. It's still at 42 million. And I don't recall the breakdown of that specifically. I'm not sure if it is broken down in terms of uh, DMV and other things, but I mean, we're I, hanging in at a 42 million estimate okay. for FY20. Total uh, losses to the T fund. So, Mr. Chair, I would assume in that um, analysis, and Neil can confirm this, um, you know, the price of gas fuel has gone down. So there's definitely, um, a, a, you know, less revenue being brought in on those taxes. But the Vermont businesses that pay those taxes to us are making their payments. Well, in, in terms of the gasoline revenue, I think the biggest impact is not the reduction in price because uh, the assessments were at their at their minimum to begin with. It's been the the reduction in people buying gas. Right. That that's where the impact is going to come. Remind us, Neil, what is that? Um, uh, that level where it cannot go below the minimum? The, since, since the gasoline taxes were revised in, I think it was FY14 and FY15, at that point in time, gasoline was over $3 a barrel. Gallon. So they set the minimums. And ever since then, they've been at the minimum. So for both, for both the TIB and also, well, the TIB minimum was set a couple of years later. What is that number? Well, I think it, you're talking about, it only goes higher when gasoline, I think reaches, is over three and a quarter dollars a gallon. <laughs> well, recently, the, um, we did that, made that change. Uh, okay, um, Commissioner, we had interrupted you. Did you, um, can you that's, uh, that's okay. I um, I understand. Are you used to it? <laughs> so we were talking about um, you asked for an update on driver's education. So I I just gave you that background. Um, so we canceled over two thousand um, exams back in March. Um, and I shared with you before when I testified that we do not have, we did not have the um, capability within our, our system to automatically reschedule those exams back out there. Um, so we said when we, oh, basically to the consumer, we had to say, when we open back up, please contact us and we'll reschedule you. So we have the impact of those exams that need to be rescheduled. And remember, it's everything. It's driver's permits, it's first time drivers, it's medical exams, it's CDL, it's motorcycle. So it's, it's everything. It's not just tests for, for new students. Um, and then we know there's a buildup coming. Um, so one of the things that we looked at is um, in partnership with the um, Agency of Education, because of the change that's going on that has occurred in school districts, how are the uh, students that are currently enrolled in driver's education going to be able to complete um, the curriculum requirements? And um, the school districts are moving forward with the online classes and they're, they're delivering that. Um, there's a state board rule that says in addition to the classroom setting, you have to have six hours of concurrent driving with your instructor. The, um, the school districts are not in a position to be able to provide those, that particular piece of the training. And after spending a great amount of time with my team and in evaluating, we discussed and have gone to um, education and with the Secretary of Education. And there's a proposal before them today to waive the concurrent six hour 
um, driving time on the classroom side of the driver education program. And this proposal to waive the six hours is conditioned based on the students that are currently enrolled in driver's education now that are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. That discussion is scheduled for uh, 2.15 this afternoon. Um, we will be participating in that. If this waiver is approved, then the department is ready to move forward with a proposal that extends um, driver testing to, um, so currently all exams take place by at DMV locations with exception of five private schools um, have the ability to do exams for us. Um, we have a proposal that we have not finalized because it depends on the state board action that we will then advance and create an opportunity with certified um, driving instructors of public school and with our, our private um, businesses, if they choose, and that's really important, um, to go through a very quick online training um, and to be able to test their students or other students um, that are currently in this, they're caught in this, this, this awkward place. Um, where if the waiver passes, then we sit here and we say, how are we going to be able to administer all of these tests? Um, and Mike, I don't know, but I think they're um, based on our conversation, and I could be wrong, committee, but I, I thought they said they probably have over 500 students enrolled right now. I believe so, yes. Um, and so that's going to be a demand on us. So we are trying to find, with this waiver, accomplish two things an alternative for students to be tested by their teachers or other educators, and an alternative that if they pass their driver's education program and they choose to come into the Department of Motor Vehicle, that we will test them without this six hour concurrent driving um, experience in the classroom. It does not change the current requirements that a student must have documented um, 40 hours of driving time, um, 40 or more, and that a minimum of that be 10 hours of driving in the evening. So that's driver's education in a, I tried to summarize it and where we are. Um, do you have questions? Questions for the commissioner? Yeah, uh, Molly, please use the electronic. <laughs> Okay, well, you, you sometimes don't see the electronics, so. I've got it up there. Anyway, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, this will be very good news to my 16-year-old grandson who's taking driver's ed right now and has been driving forever because his uncle has farm. So I, I just want to double check. So this, the six hour, um, the, the, there's the 40 hours of driving, you know, documented driving time, and then there's taking the driver's ed test. And then the six hours would be administered by the driver's ed teacher in a sort of simulated situation or um sure. how, how? proposing representative bird that we waive it that we don't require you don't require it at all okay so that is the proposal before, yeah so that is the proposal before the state board of education and that is for the students, um, I use semester and I could be wrong, but really it's for the students that started driver's ed in around January mm -hmm. um, of this year and are going through to the end of uh, the school year. It is most likely, I think all of you know that our public schools will probably not reopen. Um, it's hard to say anything could change. And so school districts don't even have a way to deliver that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so last month, I received a letter in the mail uh, that my license was going to be coming up for renewal in May, filled it out and got my new license in the mail. And I know now you've gone to online. 
I'm wondering with the online license renewal, if uh, our constituents are similarly going to get notified ahead of time so that they get a heads up that they should go ahead and renew online. So what we are, um, first of all, I just need to tell you the painting behind you is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> so I need to say that. Um, and, Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. The, um, uh, the notices that are going out, we have changed our renewal notice letters that go out to Vermonters and it actually directs them to um, the choice of doing online, online renewal. Um, and, and it's working. I, you know, I think the outreach that we've done, it's front and center on our homepage and, and, um, and, you know, so the new batch and I always get this mixed up. So everyone that's due for May, we do their mailing in April and all of those notifications included the online. Is that correct, Mike? Correct. Correct. And going forward, there'll be 60 days in advance, but we had that little interim period. So that's why some went in April for May, but going forward, it'll be 60 days out. That was really helpful for me. And I, I think people really appreciate that. So while things are still up in the air, that 60 day notice, uh, I think is gonna mean that we continue to get people renewing. Um, if you make it easy for people, then they can keep doing it. I really, really appreciate you all getting innovative there. And uh, the painting behind me is by a St. Albans artist, John Young. Uh, and um, he has painted stuff all over town and is becoming at least regionally famous. So hopefully it'll, you know, appreciate. But if you want to support local art, John Young is wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are you getting a commission on that, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, the, the painting was a commission. He, I had a, a bunch of his art displayed when I, back when I owned the cafe. And uh, we sold seven or eight of his pieces. And so he gave me this one as sort of a reward. Or a commission. <laughs> Representative Murphy. Thank you. Um, this question isn't on this particular topic, but it is for Wanda, so our Commissioner Minoli. So if you want me to hold it for another moment, I'd be happy to. Um, I leave it to you, Kurt. No, why don't you go ahead? I, it's a question about a Senate bill that was passed, S-114, mm. and um, just a section that speaks to the suspension of um, licenses, driver's licenses, not being, um, not, not occurring until the hearing on merits is held. So it, I just, clarification that it's not saying that they can't take away people's licenses, but with hearings being a little challenging, they can't do it until they have the hearing. So um, we did provide testimony on this yesterday um, and you are referencing, I think, section five of that bill. My understanding of the bill, it is a legislative um, action in accordance with the administrative uh, bulletin that judiciary put out on how they're going to conduct business during the, the COVID crisis. Um, there is, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but I should do a fairly good job remembering. If not, Mike's here. Um, the, uh, there's a section in the bill that talks about um, that the uh, superior courts or the Supreme Courts cannot uh, suspend anyone's license. Um, and this is about the, the, whole, the whole agreement. And then it references um, Vermont statute 23-1205 G and H, which is specific to um, DUIs. Right. Um, so I will let you know that we have testified. I understand that the legislature needs to move things forward and, and I respect that. Um, we have testified. So first of all, DMV is the one that on your third, so our concern is public safety, especially around the third and fourth violation of a DUI. Um, the, these, are, these are serious acts and we consider those to be, I mean, any DUI um, is concerning, um, but the process for DUI threes and fours, they have their civil hearing, then they go to criminal, if I, if I understand correctly. The way the language is written, sorry, the way the language is written, 
is to state that the uh, courts cannot suspend the licenses. The way the statute's written is we suspend them automatically in 11 days. And so we see a conflict. Um, if the intent of the legislature is that you do not want us to suspend anybody's uh, driving license during this time, um, we believe the language should be written differently. Um, we didn't propose any language for that. Um, I do think that House Judiciary, and you can consult with the Ledge Council, um, they think they do understand our concern and they may be looking at an alternative. It is my understanding that the, um, the intent is not to suspend anyone's license. Again, I can just say to you, we think that is, um, that's very concerning. We are very concerned about, about DUIs, but specifically threes and fours. When you get a DUI one, you're not suspended immediately until your court proceeding. Correct, Mike? Correct. And then your DUI, your subsequent, all fit in a few different categories. Um, so, I mean, that's what I can offer you about the language. We did not, we were not asked on the Senate, um, you know, any questions about that. Um, I, you know, I, I, again, our data shows we have one to four, um, three and four convictions a month. And, um, or not, we have one to four individuals that are, um, are, are stopped and charged with threes and fours a month. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. We don't have to ask our legislative council because she's been trying to jump in on this um, for the last five minutes. So, Andrea, please. Um, I was just going to provide a little bit of an update of what happened with S-114 in House Judiciary yesterday. Um, Judge Grierson and I can uh, circulate the link to his testimony, um, provided um, sort of uh, some insight into where the language came from. And the origination of the not requiring of the hearings, which under statute are required to happen after 21 days and 42 days for the preliminary hearing and the final hearing. Um, a memorandum that was circulated from Judge Grierson and Patricia Gable said that, in, this was in early March, these hearings are not going to necessarily be able to happen within the statutory timeframes, which means that they could be uh, dismissed. And these are for the civil suspensions when someone gets a DUI, not the criminal proceeding that sort of is going along in tandem. Administrative Order 49, which was the Declaration of Judicial Emergency, in paragraph three lists the hearings that will be required to take place. They're usually related to emergencies and these sorts of civil suspension hearings weren't included. So quite likely courts are not going to be having these hearings during the pendency of the judicial emergency, which I believe goes until the end of May. The second piece of section five subdivision three, which talks about how suspensions will not happen during uh, the pendency of the judicial emergency until there can be a hearing. That was a recommendation from the Defender General. There's an ambiguity there with regards to the fact that it says the court shall not suspend. Um, Section 1205 in Title 23 uses a lot of shall suspend and shall not resume the suspension without um, saying who is doing it, um, the Department of Motor Vehicles or the court. I believe House Judiciary's plan is to pass the language or to recommend that the House pass the language as is in S-114 as it came over from the Senate with that ambiguity, write a letter indicating that the intent is that no one, the Department of Motor Vehicles nor the court, suspend licenses until there can be a hearing. And then at some point in the future in a different bill, provide a clarification to actually amend that section of S-114 to say that it's the Department of Motor Vehicles that shall not suspend licenses. From a policy perspective, I do not think that House Judiciary is making a recommendation um, to say that licenses should be suspended without a hearing 
So for example, if the hearing wasn't gonna get held for several months, but that the automatic suspension should still go forward at 11 days for the DUI second and subsequent, I don't think that's um, the direction that they're planning on going in now, just fixing that uh, ambiguity as to who does the suspension. So this bill um, passed the Senate and has been assigned to House Judiciary. Uh, correct. It was, uh, or it will be referred to House Judiciary, I believe, tomorrow when you're on the floor. And I think it is one of the bills that is being taken up in the second block um, when you're on the floor tomorrow. Okay, so it's a fairly low number. When, when did it, when would it have passed the Senate? Um, this was an unrelated bill um, that I think just got a lot of COVID-19 piggybacked onto it. The bulk of S-114 is dealing with recommendations that came from the judiciary in terms of how they are needing to change their operations given COVID-19. Got it. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I think that's one we have to definitely take a look at. Um, Barbara, did you have any other questions about that one? Or? Okay. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, uh, no, this is, I'm waving to you. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I do want to say on the record that uh, the Department of Motor Vehicle uh, believes that licenses and violations such as these, those licenses should be suspended and we should be able to move forward as it is outlined in um, statute. And I understand that the judiciary administrative uh, agreement goes to the end of May um, and it, that it connects to hearings. Um, but we have great concern um, that uh, we will not be suspending individuals' licenses due to DUIs, especially DUI threes and fours. So, so thank you. So you're against this amendment? Um, we do not, the, I, I, I want to say the amendment of the bill there, it's the way it's written, I don't, it's, it's the intent um, and I believe that the, it's my understanding, if I understand correctly, that it is the intent of the legislature to suspend um, the allow to stop us from suspending DUIs um, during this COVID crisis. And we do not support that. I concur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I do as well. <laughs> I think I do as well, but we, we, we're not going to have a vote on that right now, I don't think. But yeah, Barbara, thank you for um, alerting us to this one. Uh, and um, so it's ju just about uh, lunchtime, but Anthea, we had you next to give us an update. Oh, oh, excuse me, uh, Commissioner, was there anything else that you wanted to tell us? Um. The one thing I quickly want to just share with the committee, because um, I know some of you have also had these questions, back to driver's education, where we originally started, um, as well as looking at alternatives to test um, this unique group of, of new drivers. Um, well, we could partner with, with the businesses on others, too, if needed. Um, we are also looking at an alternative way to um, uh, provide driver educate driver permitting testing um, to new drivers. We had hoped we were going to be able to um, connect to our current system and be able to do this online. Um, unfortunately, that is a long term um, vision and we can't do it. But Mike and his team have come up with some creative solutions that we haven't implemented yet on um, providing the driver permit written test um, in alternatives instead of having to come into a DMV location. And I, and uh, so we're still working on that. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you um, of those um, 2000 exams that got canceled and you, and you said there, there were different types of exams, mm. uh, you know, for different uh, licenses and permits. Um, can any of them be done online? I would I would think that the written test was already available online. Go ahead. Oh, 
there, there's, there's none currently on online. Um, that's kind of what we're trying to look for for the permits. Uh, for the permits. Um, you know, it brings in a whole lot of, uh, you know, how, how do you vet the individual? How do you know who it is that's taking the test? You know, we're working through all those pieces, you know, utilizing the state of Florida does some of this already. So, you know, don't tell them, but we're copying a lot of what they're doing because it's working. Um, you know, so we're, we're just trying to work through the process and find a way to make sure that the, the applicant is is taking the exam, making sure that the parents given their permission to, or guardian to, to take the exam, um, you know, and then to just moving through the process, so. Okay, good answer. Uh, anything else, Commissioner? No, um, I'll, I'll just share with you all um, that the protest expected to take place, um, I don't know if you saw it on the news, we've been watching it, it's very, been, it's, it's been very uh, low key here in front of the state house, the protesters who want uh, the governor to open up businesses quickly. Um, so we're keeping an eye on your building for you. There's 26 <laughs> people out there right now. Next, <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, that's actually good to hear. Um, uh, we're all set. Okay, I, I, and I, I wanna thank you for, um, for making it more clear on your website um, that the um, uh, car inspections are-, are I'm sorry, there's a cat a attacking my chickens. I have to go, my apologies. Okay, go, go. Oh, <laughs> um, I hope there's out of staters watching this. That, that was just great. <laughs> That's a, that is one to be remembered. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanna thank you for, for fixing up the website so that it was clear that um, that uh, people do not have to have their cars inspection inspected until July. So, um, yeah, the, actually the Junes, they'll start in June. Their Aprils got extended to June, just so I wanna make sure we're good on that. Sorry, yeah, I see even numbers, yes. Yes, we're even numbers. Everyone learned a lot about inspections. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you for your support and thank you for bringing that um, concern to us and your um, constituents' uh, concerns. So appreciated. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and Thea, if, if we could make you wait until one o'clock at this point, I think. Yeah, um, Anthea? I actually don't um, have anything. I think Lori put um, Neil and me on the agenda just in case we yeah. were asked to speak to something. But what I will do is send um, the testimony from House Judiciary yesterday so that the committee can be up to speed on what's happening with S-114. Yeah. Yes, that would be good, yeah. And so will you be with us at one o'clock? Yes. Okay, so maybe we could talk about that if we have time. I think we will. Sure. We just have two items this afternoon. Uh, and it was, it was I who asked um, Laurie to put you guys on the agenda. Okay, um, so let's bring...